embarrassed to say that uh, I haven't been here before at uh, the UN University, so great pleasure to, to be here and uh, also to share the platform with uh, Rodan Wilkinson, who, by the way, is my supervisor of my PhD, <laughs> which I uh, was able to do while I was uh, uh, an ambassador of South Africa at, uh, in Geneva. So it, it does speak a bit to the how busy we were in the round <laughs> in Geneva. <laughs> Um, so I'm, I'm now, uh, I did work uh, for just over 10 years uh, in Geneva, working for South Africa and uh, negotiating the World Trade Organization. And I, I'm now back home uh, and uh, teaching at uh, the University of Cape Town. So I thought what I'd do is really uh, reflect a bit on my experience um, in the WTO and uh, reflect also on... Um, the uh, reasons <coughs> for the collapse of the, uh, the WTO negotiations, the Doha Round negotiations, and the, uh, the crisis uh, that seems to be the theme of this, uh, this conference, the crisis of multilateralism as we understand it today, and uh, where should we be going in the future. So a few words about uh, my, my own experience. Um, as South Africa, as we came in into the um, the New World um, after the release of Nelson Mandela and the uh, New Democracy, we were uh, very committed to building multilateralism. And it speaks a bit to our own idealism uh, and our commitment that we, against uh, the advice of uh, many of our fellow developing countries, we worked hard to launch the WTO Doha round of negotiations. And I must say, uh, at that time, we, um, we understood some of the concerns of many of those who were skeptical about the round, but we, um, we were convinced that through a process of negotiations, we could uh, address some of the imbalances and asymmetries that existed in the multilateral trading system. And so um, South Africa played an important role in launching the round and indeed in um, ensuring that uh, the mandate of the Doha round spoke of the need to address these imbalances. And so at the very heart of the Doha round is paragraph two, which speaks of the need to address the needs and interests of developing countries. And then in every paragraph of the Doha round mandate, the need for uh, this round, the Doha round, uh, to incorporate the development or special and differential treatment provisions um, were, were included. Now, very soon uh, after the round had, uh, had, had been initiated, two trends began to emerge, in my view. The one spoke uh, to the inability of the, the major developed countries, the European <coughs> Union in the first instance, and then the United States, to actually uh, fulfill those promises that were made in the Doha mandate. Within months, uh, the EU uh, was, uh, you know, seemed unable to commit to reducing substantially um, subsidies in agriculture uh, and uh, to um, support the, um, the, this commitment in a, a methodology for negotiations in agriculture. Uh, the United States, uh, too, had a, a number of other concerns in a number of other areas. Um, and by the time we got to the first ministerial meeting in Cancun, uh, the whole ministerial meeting collapsed uh, because of this inability of the developed countries to commit to making substantial reductions in agricultural subsidies. Uh, specific concerns of countries like um, uh, the Cotton Four, um, spoke to the, um, the, the injustice, the inequity in the trading system where, you know, four cotton producers in Africa where uh, <clears throat> uh, their, their livelihoods were undermined by U.S. Uh, subsidies. Um, also, the LDCs raised issues about duty-free, quota-free, and the United States was unable to address this. So that was one trend that emerged, and it was to continue, not just uh, Cancun, but to, to the next ministerial meeting, Hong Kong, and then, of course, the collapse of the whole Doha round in uh, 
uh, July 2008. That was one trend. The other trend I thought was very interesting for me personally, <clears throat> as I saw myself as a young activist at the time, um, the emergence of uh, an a powerful alliance of developing countries. In Cancun, as the Moran collapsed, out of that came the birth of perhaps the most powerful developing country alliance the world has ever seen, the creation of the G20 group of developing countries in agriculture, led by Brazil, uh, and uh, of course, uh, India and China played a key role in that. South Africa was in um, uh, immediately, Argentina, and a number of others, including some of the bigger countries in Africa, Nigeria, Egypt, um, Argentina, and uh, uh, Uruguay. Uh, so the, the most significant countries in the, world, in the developing world in one alliance, um, this was a unique uh, phenomena. Uh, we saw that uh, building of alliances and this process continue from Cancun um, throughout the next conference. By the time we got to Hong Kong, you know, we had, a, we had an alliance of about 110 countries and it included the least developed countries, uh, very organized, um, worked together uh, to negotiate and fight for duty-free, quota-free market access. Uh, G33 countries in developing countries concerned about food security, led by India, Indonesia. These countries you know, were active in the process. Uh, African countries were united as ever. Uh, so this was a, 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 an amazing phenomenon. What was also interesting uh, for me as a, as a trade negotiator, and I was deeply involved in the trade negotiations, not only on agriculture, also on industrial products. Uh, there we formed an alliance called the Nama 11, countries who were interested in ensuring that uh, there was some policy space for developing countries as they were industrializing. South Africa was the coordinator of that group. And throughout this process, what we had was a real engagement. So these were alliances not just built to oppose. They were not NGOs <laughs> fighting on the streets to protest. They were uh, to organize and mobilize um, uh, people both inside and outside the room, as we did, because many of the NGOs supported the concerns and demands, say of the Cotton Four, for example, and others. But we were engaged in the details of the negotiations and we did negotiate constructively, and we did strike deals and compromises with the United States, with the European Union, on very complex issues, uh, on agricultural subsidies, on you know, quotas, on safeguards. All of these things, where the US needed more flexibility, where the, United, where the, the European Union needed some assistance and support <clears throat> uh, for its farmers, these compromises were made and given to them in exchange for some flexibility also for developing countries. And so by 2008, there was a whole big package, the REF3 and REF4 so-called text of negotiations, which uh, included a number of compromises, but it also contained, in my view, a number of significant advances that the developing countries made so for the first time, S&D was not just a, you know, a special differential treatment, wasn't just a rhetorical statement um, that was a, like a promise. <clears throat> it had some teeth because we negotiated it. We negotiated it in each of the provisions of the new agreements um, of the Doha round. Uh, we, we made advances, even on duty-free, quota-free, although the United States didn't get agreed to 100%, but we got 97% for, for, for LDCs. Uh, a number of, of uh, small and vulnerable economies, they were recognized as a group. Their particular flexibilities were included in a number of these provisions. But by 2008, uh, <coughs> the United States couldn't move <coughs> uh, on uh, a number of issues. Uh, the ministerial meeting collapsed, and um, it's now, I think, a historical fact, uh, although some people may have different views, but uh, the round is now dead. The Doha round, for all intents and purposes, the first round ever in the history of the GATT. There were eight rounds before, <laughs> since 1947. 
Many had uh, travails and challenges. They took longer than they were intended from the beginning, but they succeeded at the end. This time, it failed. And I think some of the reasons uh, my colleague has mentioned, and one of those reasons, of course, I think is the rise of developing countries. They were not there in the Uruguay round in such a significant way. They didn't play such an important role. Um, and uh, the, the, in, each, in each round since 1947, it was uh, really the EU and the US that closed the deals. Um, and uh, this time round, the EU and the US, they had to negotiate with the major developing countries and, of course, the demands of a number of smaller countries to close the deal, and they couldn't do that. So I think that was one of the reasons for, uh, as, as my colleague has mentioned correctly, but what did they say? <clears throat> so the United States, um, at that time, the USTR, as the round collapsed, was led by Susan Schwab. <clears throat> she wrote an article, so her, her whole reasoning is, is written in Foreign Affairs, an article in Foreign Affairs, in which uh, you know, she uh, stated very clearly what the reasons were for the US um, deciding to conclude the round, uh, to, to collapse the round, as she, she in her view, it, was, it had collapsed. And she said the main reason was the rise of developing countries. She said the world had changed since the year 2001, when the round was launched. She said that countries like China, India, Brazil, and others had now become uh, not just emerging countries, but they had emerged. They become significant players. They needed to take more responsibility. But there were other players, uh, you know, as we got, there was interestingly, you know, uh, about U.S., there are a few issues in this Congress, and I've been watching it over the last, uh, uh, you know, uh, decade and a half or so. There are a few issues on which there, there has been bipartisan support. Uh, on trade, you know, the one issue on which there is bipartisan support between the Republicans and the Democrats is that the round is dead. And they both colluded with each other. So Susan Schwab passed the baton to uh, Ron Kirk seamlessly you know, between 2008 and 2009, and Ron Kirk simply took over, continued the same rhetoric, and the business community, you know, worked together with both of them, Susan and, and then with Ron Kirk. And uh, interestingly, when you dissect, you know, what actually was going on in the business community, there actually was a, there was a fracturing between those businesses who were the winners of the new globalization and those businesses in the United States that couldn't move. So protectionism was on the rise, as still is in the United States and in Europe, and in agriculture and in manufacturing, the, those business interests dug in their heels, they refused to move, they didn't make concessions, and they were one of the reasons for the collapse of the round. But the other part of the business community, the businesses that were flourishing in the new global uh, globalization, uh, phase of globalization, these businesses formed themselves into a number of coalitions, one of which was led by the, the, um, the CSI, the Coalition of Services Industries, and uh, they argued that uh, the Doha round is obsolete. They said because the uh, globalization has taken a new form and it has deepened, and this form is called global value chains. And they said, based on this new reality, the old ways of doing business, um, the old issues that were relevant at the time of Doha are now obsolete. Agriculture is not important. Tra uh, tariffs are no more important. It's, it's all about uh, value chains and trade facilitation. And this is what uh, sh we should concentrate on now. Now, of course, global value chains is the old concept but it was now brought in uh, into the trade narrative, argued by the United States as being a new basis for um, us to analyze the global economy and therefore the need to revise the whole mandate of the Doha round. And the United States then also said that the way, the way in which the whole Doha round was constructed needs to be revised and it called this a new pathway. He said, we need new pathways to do business. This whole issue of negotiating things as a round with all issues together, you know, in one basket, doesn't work anymore. There are too many people in the room. Um, we need to isolate the issues uh, 
prioritize them. And we need to work with those who are willing to work and negotiate. And those who are you know, not willing and who are not ready, they should wait. And uh, this was uh, uh, what they started. They started a, something called plurilaterals. So they isolated the issue that was important to the United States, services. And they created a, a services plurilateral. And they said, well, this is the new way of doing business. Right. Uh, <clears throat> so what we saw in the, in this, in the, in the new way of doing business, <clears throat> we began to think about this. And <clears throat> when you look at this, is what Rawdon taught me uh, at, uh, uh, <laughs> when I was doing a PhD, um, that actually, uh, you know, a very interesting book that throws some light on this behavior of the United States, written by Mark Mazoa, called Governing the World. And what he says is that actually what this behavior of the United States is not strange at all. It's actually exactly what the U.S. has been doing since 1947. And he says that the U.S. has a very interesting way of combining universalism and exceptionalism writing the rules in a way that mostly served its core interests and generally exempting itself from those rules that its legislators disliked. So at the very beginning, you know, remember when the GATT was created, it was actually the Havana Charter that was negotiated and agreed. And the United States threw it out in 1950 because it didn't like it. And uh, throughout the GATT, every round, um, they were initiated by the United States, and when the United States didn't agree, uh, the issue was not included. So 1956, my own little country, South Africa, wanted to discuss wool. The U.S. didn't agree, so the South Africa pulled out. But this was the way in which the U.S. behaved um, in, in the GATT uh, throughout. And so the behavior of the United States today, the move to mega regionals, you know, moving, taking its energy out of the United States. So the ambassador of the United States in in Geneva, um, is now also responsible for the TTIP negotiations. So he spends, clearly spends more time on the TTIP than in the Doha round of negotiations. So the energy of the US is taken out of the multilateral into bilateral um, negotiations. <clears throat> this, is not, this is not new. This is a trend which you know, they have, uh, they have you know, used uh, previously. And it seems to me that the other concern with uh, global value chains is that it takes us back to the Washington consensus. The idea that in order to develop, the argument is that you need to go along with value chains. You need to participate. You need to join these value chains because freer trade, deregulation at the border, removing barriers at the border is better for you um, and is good for development. And it seems that this idea is, you know, uh, was critiqued a long ago by um, a fellow called Carl Poliani when he said that self-regulating markets, you know, they, they don't exist in reality, only in theory. They have to be, you know, markets are embedded in the social. So you have to look at the development issues and you have to look at the environmental issues and you can't divorce the WTO Doha round from the SDGs. And it is for this reason that in a book that I wrote some years ago, uh, called uh, Reforming the WTO, I argue that the WTO has to have norms. It has to have values and principles, and this has to be the underlying logic of the rest of the negotiations in the WTO. And, that, and those norms must start from the need to put development <coughs> at the center of the WTO negotiations. So what of the future? It seems to me that um, until we are able to look at the WTO as part of the multilateral system as a whole, and I was very pleased today to listen to the minister of, uh, the ex-minister of Finland speak about um, stability um, and peace, because it would seem to me that without situating the WTO in a broader global context of peace and security and the need for solidarity, and this is what's this is what is uh, going to be the main loss for developing countries, the smallest ones from Africa, um, from, the loss of, from the collapse of the Doha Round. What they had in the Doha Round was solidarity. We all supported the cause of the poorest countries, and we leveraged the, their participation 
to, get, to make gains. So the cotton fall, to put their issues, the duty-free, quota-free issue, many other issues, we leverage that to, you know, uh, as part of the bargain, the grand bargain in the WTO. Now the round has collapsed, and they're out, and they're marginalized. And it would seem to me that to, to ensure stability and peace, and to ensure development, uh, we need to bring back, for all the reasons we started and we created the, w, the, the United Nations, we need to go back to uh, the basic uh, notion and the basic principles of multilateralism. And it would seem to me that this is the, the only way uh, uh, out of the, the current impasse in the WTO. Thank you. Thank you, Faisal.